Hello, Asia Society Hong Kong. Welcome to Zurich. We are here in the second underground floor of the Museum Riedberg, where the special exhibition Love, Fight, Feast, the multifaceted world of Japanese narrative art is presently on show. My name is Kan Trin, and I'm the curator of Japanese art here at the museum and one of the co-curators of the show. The exhibition presents the result of a four years collaborative research project between Professor Estelle Bauer from the Institut National de Langue et Civilisation Orientale, the INALCO in Paris, and Professor Melanie Trede from University of Heidelberg and myself. Featuring over 100 works dating from the 13th century to the 20th century, Love Fight Feast offers a comprehensive survey of Japanese narrative art, a genre well loved and highly respected in Japan, but until now less known in the West. With narrative art, we mean all imagery that accompany or are based on a literary text. The images could be a sequence of images or a single illustration that directly or indirectly references a particular story. As a matter of fact, stories of uh, amorous liaisons between princesses and noblemen, between bitter wars uh, of rival clans, uh, stories of uh, evil spirits and supernaturals exist in all cultures. Yet rarely does paintings and three-dimensional objects that are that drawn on um, narratives play such an important role in the arts and in the quotidian culture as in Japan. There, um, visual storytelling does not only have a long tradition, but it is also considered the pinnacle of artistic expression. What makes Japanese art stand out uh, is its rich diversity in terms of subject matters, materialities, formats, but also its manifold functions and meanings. And the first two rooms of the exhibitions encapsulate this, this multimediality and also all the facets of Japanese narrative arts. The paintings, woodblock prints, silk ropes, uh, metal objects and lacquer wares uh, in the following six rooms convey stories of faith and devotion, of courtship and romance, of loyalty and courage, but also of havoc-wrecking monsters and feasting animals. They also bear witness to the uh, imagination of generations of artists uh, who have always applied their fantasies, their skills in creating ever innovative visual adaptations of the various tales to match the shifting aesthetic preferences of diverse audiences. Depending on the social status and taste of the commissioner, the occasion for which an art object was created, and the artistic background of the painters and craftspeople, the same story can be illustrated in myriad ways. One of the most illustrated stories in Japanese art is the tale of Genji, arguably the oldest novel in world literature. It was written by the court lady Murasaki Shikibu at the beginning of the 11th century, describing the many love affairs of the shining prince Genji, the vicissitudes of his political career, and the fate of his progeny. The 54 chapters of the tale of Genji has inspired generations of painters, print designers, and craftspeople for many, many visual adaptations. So we see Genji scenes on panoramic folding screens in miniature album leaves as pattern on silk robes or as decoration 
on lacquerware, which belong to uh, a bridal trousseau. We can also detect Genji's uh, scenes in the inner panels of a bridal palanquin, such as this one, which belonged to a princess from the Tokugawa family who ruled Japan from the early 17th century to the late 19th century. Many works in the exhibitions are not signed by any artist, and it is customary for art objects, for three-dimensional art objects that were created in the pre-modern era. But in terms of paintings, we can say that all three influential artistic lineage for narrative painting are represented in the show that are the Kano School, the Tosa School, and the Sumiyoshi School. And for the um, woodblock prints, uh, all the uh, significant masters are represented, such as Hokusai, Harunobu, Utamaro, Kuniyoshi, and Yoshitoshi. Some of the objects, of the lacquer objects and paintings, also boast an excellent provenance, having belonged to the nobility, not only in Japan, but also in Europe. So, for example, the Tokugawa family, or even the Queen Marie Antoinette of France. What makes this exhibition unique is that it draws together works exclusively from European collections. And in doing so, we have been able to present works uh, that have never been exhibited before, such as this wonderful set of six hand scrolls illustrating the story of the women eating okra, Shuten Doji. The exhibition also includes digital interactive presentations like the linear navigator or a video triptych that add another dimension to the viewing experience. Hello Asia Society Hong Kong. Welcome to the Museum Riedberg. My name is Alex Omschichowski and I'm the curator for Chinese art. The Museum Riedberg houses a wonderful collection of Chinese ceramics, the famous Mei Yin Tang collection, showing more than 600 pieces from the Neolithics to the 12th century. Let me show you some of the most spectacular pieces. These elegant stem cups and goblets were produced more than 4,000 years ago in the Lungshan culture in eastern China. The wall of these vessels is thin as eggshell, only about one millimeter, and the stem is hollow and even decorated with openwork. For such sophisticated objects, two groundbreaking inventions were needed. One was a fast spinning potter wheel that would allow to scrape off the walls to the preferred thinness. The other one was a kiln with two chambers, one for the firing goods and one for the fire, so that the fire would consume the oxygen, a reduction process took place and this hardened the wall of the vessels. These fragile vessels are testimony to the great knowledge and skills of the potters in Neolithic China. Another outstanding group of objects are over there. These pots from the 5th century BC are the first high-fire ceramics. Temperatures above 1,200 degrees transform the kaolinitic clay into a dense, hard and waterproof structure. That is why they are often called proto-porcelain. These high temperatures also created the first glazes by the ashes settling on the surface of the clay. These ash glazes give the pots a warm golden hue. And for the people in ancient times that have never seen a glaze before, this must have looked like shining bronzes. Also, the form of these vessels is quite unusual. These small handles and tiny rings would break off easily and are not practical for ceramics. 
they remind us of the bronze vessels of these times. And actually, these pots were created as imitations of the far more precious bronze ritual objects. Pottery became the preferred material for tomb goods in the Han Dynasty in the second century BC. The tombs were built as little underground palaces for the deceased, but not furbished with real goods, but with clay models of everything the deceased needed for a comfortable afterlife, like housing, uh, stables and farm animals, stoves and kitchenware, and also all kinds of servants. This huge watchtower made up of several stories would not only guarantee protection from enemies and evil spirits, it would also allow the tomb owner to take up lodging in the upper floor in the hot summer days and enjoy the cool breeze. The deceased also wanted to enjoy entertainment in the afterlife. So figurines of dancers, musicians and acrobats were placed in the tombs. These three ladies, graceful dancers, are stunning examples of such figures. Look at their graceful movements and at their beautiful faces. The number and sophistication of tomb figurines increased again in the Tang Dynasty. The 7th to 9th century is often called the Golden Age of Chinese culture. The vast empire stretched out far into Central Asia. And the capital of China, Chang'an, was a cosmopolitan metropole, with traders and merchants from all over Eurasia living there. Their exotic and foreign goods were highly popular with the elite of Tang China. This life of luxury is beautifully mirrored in the tomb figurines of the time. Western traders were depicted with their typical costumes and especially with an exaggeration of their non-Chinese facial features. As this man with his long beard, his bulging eyes and his large nose. He might have been a merchant leading his camels with his precious goods, but also maybe a horse trader, bringing his noble, um, well-built animals from Central Asia that were so loved by the Chinese aristocracy of that time. These two large stallions are uh, especially fine examples of the thousands of horse figures that were placed in the tombs. Although they were made from molds, they look extremely lively uh, with their well-decorated saddles and harness. They are covered with a glaze called sansai or three-colored glaze, typical for this time. This lead-blazed sansai glaze melted at low temperatures and tended to flow a lot. But the potters made use of this feature. For example, in this pot, they decorated it with stripes that melted together in an intricate pattern. Or the little colorful green, blue and yellow pot that was first dipped in a white slip so that the colors would shine even more brightly. With the end of the Tang Dynasty and the beginning of the Sung Dynasty in the 9th century, we witness a totally new aesthetic taste. The high-educated, art-loving scholar official became the new role model and uh, pureness and constraint the new virtue. These new aesthetic values also influenced the ceramics. Not opulence and precious material, but excellent craftsmanship and natural elegance were now emphasized. Many of the kilns started to concentrate on one technique and developed these to perfection. Just look at this small dish. Its form is in total harmony and its glaze, it's flawless. Simple as it looks, it is extremely difficult to produce. The rim has to be cut when the clay is not too hard, otherwise it would break. But if it is too soft, the walls would cave in. It needs a lot of knowledge and skills by the potters. To produce such a beautiful surface, these pieces have to be fired in special capsules to prevent dust and ashes to settle on the molten glaze. 
we can assume that only very few pieces in the ceramic production came out in this perfection. These white wares were produced in the Xing and Ding kilns in northern Chinese Hebei province. The potters used no colors. Decoration was only made by incised lines of different deaths that would only show very subtle on the uh, objects as in this beautiful little water pot or by mold decoration as in this small tray. Other ceramic centers of the same time concentrated on greenware. The beautiful light green, bluish or olive colors were produced by a reduction of the iron oxide in the glaze material. To achieve the right hue of color, the potters had to have extreme knowledge and experience. Only slight changes in the amount of iron oxide, in the burning temperature, or even in the amount of oxygen in the kilns would change the outcome completely. As with the white wares, the potters of the green wares totally relied on the beauty of the monochrome. As in this charming gourd-shaped ewer with its very thick and opaque glaze, or they would decorate the pieces with a pattern cut by a slanted knife, as in these two small ewers. The glaze then would settle in the recesses and produce these uh, subtle nuances of green color. The most precious piece of the Mayang Tang collection seems to be, at first sight, the most simple one. This small dish used as a brush washer is pure understatement. Its form is plain, no decoration, but its great beauty lies precisely in that utmost restraint and elegant naturalness. It was crafted in the famous Zhu kilns in Henan province, known for its sky blue glaze, often covered by a fine net of crackles. Most of the production of this famous kiln was sold to the imperial household, and only very, very few pieces came on the open market. After only 20 years, the area was in turmoil and the kilns were destroyed. So this rareness made this rueware even more precious in the eyes of the scholar literati of China. Some of the pieces, although made as for use, for daily use, even entered the imperial art collection. The Museum Riedberg is very proud to be able to present one of these fabled objects to the public. Some of my favorite pieces is the Dunware with the striking blue colors, sometimes decorated by purple splashes. No other ceramics of the time has such an intense coloring. But strikingly, this glaze doesn't contain blue pigment. That we see it as blue is a pure visual effect. When fired in the right temperature, the glaze forms little droplets, and these reflect the lights so that we see it as blue, in the same effect that we see the sky or a lake as blue. But these droplets only form when the ceramic is fired between 1300 and 1280 degrees. It's dazzling that the potters a thousand years ago would control the temperatures in the kilns that perfectly. I hope you enjoyed the small tour through our ceramic collections a collection that enchants and fascinates our visitors every day.